Hello and welcome to the Sibsey West Midlands Region vlog and podcast. My name is Joss Brownlee and I'm joined today by Phil Pearson of Pearson Consult. Phil, welcome. Great to have you here today. Thank you for inviting me. No problem. Uh, Phil Pearson is the Managing Director of UK-based lift and escalator consultants Pearson Consult Limited. He has been in the lift and escalator industry since 1986, having previously been a building services engineer. Phil is an, has experience of the lift industry from all aspects, from a client perspective, responsible for all lifts and escalators at a large department store group, forming and running a lift esca and escalator company, designing lifts and escalators for a lift manufacturer, and 20 years as a lift and escalator consultant, the last seven of which has been operating his own practice. Philip is an active member of SIBSI, this includes being a committee member and papers chair for the Sibsey West Midlands region and is responsible for organising and delivering CPD to the region and nationally and members of the Sibsey Lift Group Executive Committee, responsible for publicity and organising northern events. So that's quite an introduction, Phil. Thank you. Um, well, tell nice us a bit to be more. busy. Yeah, tell us a bit more about yourself. Um, I've been in the industry all my life, left school at 16, went to did a full engineering apprenticeship, and uh, was, which at the time was a thing to do if you didn't go to uni, was to get a, get a trade behind you. And to o be levels, honest... O-levels, A-levels? One. Okay. One O-levels, yes. That was, actually, it was gained at night school. Uh, I went to work at uh, GEC Power Engineering at um, Trafford Park in Manchester. Okay. And uh, I worked there for the for, for, first 15 years of my working life, fantastic training ground. You know, there's a lot of very experienced uh, ex engineers there. And in fact, you can only be called an engineer if you had a degree. That was, yeah. the, that was the ruling at the time. Uh, so an excellent uh, place to learn the trade of project management and uh, how to work with other people, different skills and areas. Uh, and set against that, a, a, a very challenging job of the works engineers department for the last, um, so I'd say for 10 years of being there, where I got involved in various projects and became the utilities engineer because it had been a, not an American company, but founded by Westinghouse originally, then Metropolitan Vickers, then AEI. It had American terms, yeah, the janitor's department. And so I was a utilities engineer, which meant I was responsible for all the energy use and the, the section of factory I was responsible for which was about a 300,000 square foot manufacturing area with a yeah, fabrication so shop. So you're used to beating inches rather than metres and, and squaring. Right. And... Yes, all my exams are only feet and inches, yes. Um, and uh, I, I worked with the works engineers department and I was to get some amazing projects, re-roofed a 100,000 square foot factory on uh, energy conservation to remove the old northern lights and put an insulated roof onto it. Um, other various projects installed um, three huge compressors to make us independent from the main works because the uh, the factory there was split into different works, turbine generators, switchgear, which is right where I worked, and uh, other factories. So we installed um, our own general our own compressors, which had a heat recovery system to put the heat in winter back into the factory. Okay. Um, changed all the lighting in the entire factory from uh, mercury vapor to high pressure sodium, including all the tests to make sure it was the core cool rendition because there's a lot of wiring works happened in the, uh, the switchgear works. Um, so it had to be good core cool rendition. And they did that completely of their own labour at nights. The night to do the, the conversion work, converted the existing fittings to high pressure sodium. Um, so great training ground. And then from there, I went into retail engineering at Lewis's Retail, as it, as it was and as the energy manager for the, the group responsible for 11 huge department stores, the one that people will know in the West Midlands is the Birmingham one on the minerals, or they had the minerals going through it on uh, Cornwall Place. Um, obviously all gone now on the, the Manchester store. The large stores were 500,000 square feet, the massive things, and I was responsible for reducing the energy, of control, responsible for the energy usage on all 11 sites, uh, which I I did until the demise of Lewis's group. It wasn't my fault. I actually was doing quite a good job of reducing the energy bills uh, at the time. 
um, but it was a good experience. That's where I got introduced to lift engineering. I was responsible for the lift and escalator budgets on all the stores. I mean, you consider uh, some stores like uh, Birmingham had something like 13 escalators on it and a whole bunch of lifts. Um, there was a, a big uh, area of, um, a, a cost and a responsibility. Yeah. I did that for the entire group. Um, and we had our own lift engineers at Lewis's for the, the Northwest stores, Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool, Blackpool and Hanley. And um, they were quite good, very good guys. And basically, I formed my own lift company with them when Lewis's went bust. And we then um, set out and it worked as a, our own lift business for five years. Um, unfortunately, hit the recession in the mid 90s and um, it, 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 it uh, ceased trading. So I went, went working for a lift manufacturer designing lifts and um, which is excellent experience. So I've done the, done the lift maintenance bit because I didn't do lift installations with the, the company I formed. It was just purely maintenance. I didn't want to get um, too much capital tied up in installations. Uh, so I go working for a manufacturer it was ideal because it just completed my experience of designing lifts and troubleshooting on them. I was sent out to sites and I went out to Gaza in Israel or not Israel technically, but a Gaza to co finish commissioning a lift out there that um, they sold. Um, so it, it really was a, a, a fantastic experience on the, the design and commissioning side. So it completed that. And then in the early 2000s was headhunted by a, the lift consultancy, or a, a building services consultancy, Foreman Roberts, or Foreman's as they were then, uh, to run the Manchester office. Uh, so I joined Foreman's and ran the Man Manchester office, grew the staff from um, two of us to um, at the when I left was uh, four or five engineers, uh, five lift consultants. And I went to join the uh, SKM Sinclair Night Mers uh, to, to form their lift department. I didn't, didn't have one. And um, I was set, went there, say there till 2015. Okay. And was taken up, taken up by Jacobs Engineering, who worked for Jacobs for two years, um, and then went to paddle my own canoe, on my own consultancy. Yep. Um, done some fantastic projects since then. Manchester Airport Terminal Two was my lift design. The Liverpool Football Club new main stand was uh, our design, and we just completed the works, our works on the um, Anfield Road stand. Uh, so we done, we did Etihad Football Stadium. We did the new extant expansion there. Um, so do you, some good... do you support do you support any of those clubs? It's, it's a very slight shade of pink. I'm a, I'm a Manchester Red, but I've never been to a match. I've been to more Liverpool matches than I have been to a, to Luton United matches. Um, so we um so no, I don't, we don't I, I design stadium. I don't, I don't do in fact when I was doing the Liverpool football stadium. Not new main stand. My boss at the time, who was a, a, a real red, said, and I said, I've not done any football stadiums. He says, get yourself down to a proper stadium, down to United, and see how see how they do it. <laughs> yeah, well, that was a, and where the office was actually was in um, in Salford Keys. The United ground dominated the skyline. You know, so it's uh, it's always and in fact when he went to work in Manchester office, uh, or London office, but at um it was I think at the time it was for foreman's. The questions you asked were, well, what were your hobbies, um, you know, things like that. When you went to work in the Manchester office, the question was, which team do you support? Blue, yeah. Are you blue or red? That was that was the first question. And after that, the hobbies maybe you know, were um, another part of the, the questions. But it's, so, yes, yeah, so the football stadium is one we've done. We're doing a, a, a huge project in Gateshead at the moment, which is a 12,500 seat arena, a, a 10,000 square metre uh, exhibition hall and was two hotels where well, two hotels have been split off the project at the moment but that's just restarted okay um so, uh, so we, from we think from being in sorry go on yes so we're, we're, we're punching we say we're punching above our weight now we've got iso 9001 uh to demonstrate internationally of our, our capabilities and our, and our organizational skills um we've, i've worked out in qatar um Ironically, after I left Jacobs, I went out there working as a consultant for them. I was out in Qatar on the metro system for three months. 
um, just after I started my own practice. So I worked internationally in Qatar. I also did, um, well, I was at SKM lift survey work in Singapore. I went out to Singapore and surveyed um, about 15 lifts out there. Lovely so city. We, it is, yes. It's uh, the temperature and humidity takes some getting used to, especially when you're on top of a lift car doing the survey and there's no ventilation. There's a 100 watt light bulb light in the shaft because the light shaft lighting was lap tungsten lamps and the, 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 you try you can't hold your pencil because it's slipping through your fingers the perspiration yes uh, and i've never surveyed a lift in the jungle before and one of the sites on this line we were surveying uh, they built the line and then built the developments afterwards but the development hadn't been built at this particular stop so it's just pristine jungle uh, just behind the fence so the station was all built and then there's a chain link fence and then jungle and um, the, one day I went on site and uh, two Malaysian work engineers working, lift engineers working with me to show me down and uh, sites of the, of the lifts on the line. And they, they went to the machine room door and uh, they stood behind it like a firefighter. And um, I was sort of waiting to open the machine room door. I said, well, why are you stood there like that, hiding behind the door? I said, open it, uh, pass them. Snake, snake. I mean, snake. I realised they meant there was a, a snake and the uh, security on the station had seen a, sta a snake and they thought it was in the lift motor room. And these Malaysian engineers were about to open this door to let the snake out. Yeah. What they hadn't realised is I was in the firing line for the, the, for the snake. The, the, as it happened, that was the day the client came around to see what we were doing. And he gave a real tour strip off of no end. He put my consultant at risk, you know, which, and uh, yeah, so well after that, the, the engineers were brilliant. They they went to the lift motor before me because they're used to snakes to check there were no snakes in there on all those yeah. stations. And uh, when you're doing the top of the shaft and the steel work above your head, and you have to check pulleys and conditions, you know, you, every time you put your hand up, you dreaded finding a snake under your hand or a scorpion. Yeah, so that's, it was, um, that's, a, that's a slightly different uh, dynamic to a risk assessment, having to, to check for. Yes. And ironically, or, or interestingly, actually, my boss at the time said, your risk assessment needs to be, um, you know, correct. So I actually put on the risk assessment, heat exhaustion and temperature yep. and snakes. So I actually had my risk assessment for Robert got out there, and actually yeah. covered it. And uh, the actual engineers were as good as gold there. After a while, they were doing the top of the shaft inspections and then we did a presented our report to the um to the board of the transport system uh, just to stay a couple of extra days to finish the report off and present it good that was Excellent. a great, great experience and that again that was with skm that wasn't it wasn't independently but it's uh it all adds to the experience and the confidence of working abroad yeah where you've got where you've got no support immediately you, you know uk is eight hours time difference away so you, there's no no sort of ringing back to find out unless you get up and crack a door. Did, did you say you started off as an apprentice? Yes, apprentice yep. electrical, craft apprentice actually. And I think and after the first year, I transferred to a technician apprentice. So I did um, night school, all the all day, day release and night school till the age of 20, 21. So my T5 technician fifth year. So you got um, on the job practical experience of uh, making off cables and wires and uh, you know oh, yeah. and and uh, big, with big big wires. Well, with, like, with the, go on. With switch gear is big stuff. Is I worked on the place, a session called the copper bench for quite a while before I went. On, I went to, then I was on there for initially, and then went on to the test department. We were actually were testing the equipment, um, but on the copper bench, you know, you were dealing with copper conductors that sort of size, and you know, the other. Because high voltage and, and some of the stuff that was high current What's as that well. Sort of, sort of leg diameter? Uh, it's not quite that, but it was uh, certainly the, the various devices called line traps, which are a way of taking a signal from a high voltage line down to a low voltage uh, system. And, uh, you know, it was very heavy duty copy, a big tin bath or solder bath to dip the tin the ends of the wires. And uh, the, the switch screw we made was um, the highest voltage. For, um, 275 kv okay in fact no it's 400 000 volts actually it did some of the cgb as it was central electricity generating board it is somewhere um, their switch gear 
uh, repairing it, and that was 400,000 volts. But the, the, the test bed they had for the normal testing entire switch gear was uh, 275 kV. So is that so, uh, along the lines of the, the uh, distribution between pylons that we've currently got? Yes, the super grid, yeah. 400,000 volt super grid. Yeah. Um, all, all uh, some was air blast circuit breakers, some was oil oil circuit breakers, but the size of a size of a house. So when you did tested them, you put scaffold the scaffold them out, scaffolded them, and then you know you then did your test from the top of the scaffold. That's where they had, they could get access to the high voltage equipment, and then they had a a, a, um, a transformer at one end that works to pass the the voltage down to test them on the actual. You know, in, insulation tests. So practical so. experience all the way through to theoretical experience and and everything in between. It sounds. Yes, it's uh, and again, being GC, it's uh, a great amount of very knowledgeable people. You know, you, you, when you dealt with people in the fabrication shop, they knew everything about fabrication. You know, there was, um, and it was on machine tool maintenance um, for a while, which meant we. They bought some very expensive machining centres and had to run them 24 hours a day. Um, and as part of that, they needed to support them. So I was actually sent on two training courses for machine tools because of an electrical mechanical apprentice. Um, and so I was on call to, for the machine. So I got a, a phone call. And those days, not no bleepers, phone call in the middle of the night. You know, this is the machine's broke down. Can you come? We'll have a look at it. Yep. And you sort of drive in there at three o'clock in the morning because it's you know every hour you lost you couldn't make up because it's working 24 hours a day yeah and then to try and fix it and then if you couldn't fix it because the maintenance had been on it already the mean the night shift had been on it and they couldn't fix it and they're the ones that called you in so you knew when you got there it was going to be a, a difficult problem up against um, it on the on the clockwise on, and, on the clock so yes that's it the middle of the night and again nowhere to refer back to no other so it was a uh, and it's all adds to the experience and it's, it all gives that round, all round. And again, being GEC and the, the prop out the engineers there say very knowledge, gave that self confidence that you could do it. You don't ask them, you not, don't dare ask them because they'll give you, what's the word for it, give you a um, hard time because you, you know, the casino you should know. Yeah. So and anyone in particular you'd like to um, acknowledge for, for knowledge, uh, training and experience? Probably the guy who made the game of the job in the Brooks Engineering Department, um, Ron Reed, very experienced guy. Smoked a pipe, Ron, long older guy, and um, he go in his office. Every seat, feel the I feel the desk smoking his pipe. Through working time, and he says, "I can think as well on my feet on the desk as I can think with them on the floor." And the reason he smoked a pipe, be in a meeting, a big meeting, a management meeting, and so he's asking a question. You know, get his back it out and his lighter and tamp it down and light it because it gave him thinking time. Yeah. And at that time, smoking in the office was accepted. So it was his way of, you know, lighting his pipe and giving me time, just a few minutes to think about the answer. And um, a really experienced guy again. And, um, you know, it's sort of, it, it for, I've forgotten more than you've learned on works engineering. Yeah, but very experienced and knowledgeable guy by the sounds of things. But yeah, you're absolutely right. In in meetings, it's uh, uh, having the time to formulate your thoughts and and respond and and answer the questions um, accurately. Um, and yeah, it, it sounds you you've got a vast experience of uh, uh, thinking on your feet and and uh, drawing from your experience whilst uh, abroad and in the UK and Europe as well. So uh, yeah. Um, any uh, STEM or outreach activities uh, passing on that knowledge to the younger generation? Yes, I'm doing a session for a commentary in um, so that's Coventry University. That's not Coventry, it's Borough, Borough University. Get the right one. My apologies. Uh, I'm doing a session for them on lifts and escalators in uh, October. They're okay. doing a, a session there, there, there to increase our understanding of lifts and escalators. And that's uh, degree students. No, it's the uh, the um i think diploma ones okay um and i'm also presenting a paper at the lift and escalator symposium in um two weeks a week week and a half's time on um rigid chain technology as applied to a truck lift um and, and i'm actually 
yeah. So um, those are the sort of exercises I try and do, as well as obviously, you know, the uh, sessions we've done for the uh, Best Midlands Lift Group. Yeah, well, you recently did a, a presentation uh, on um, becoming chartered. That's right. That's a, a real challenge um, to fit, make, fit it in with your day job uh, to a, a five to seven thousand word report. Um, as it happens, it's on rigid chain technology. Uh, we're doing a, a two lifts in Manchester at the moment, uh, just been completed and been used in uh, by the contracts of beneficial use. These are two 40 ton truck lifts that go up seven and a half metres, sorry, six and a half metres. And it's a theatre in Manchester, a brand new theatre that's been built above a roadway. So it's a, a 1700 seat theatre to one side of the road. And the other side of the road is a 5,000 space auditorium, all six and a half metres above road level. So they needed the lift to be able to take the um, the props and also visiting uh, performances and events up there. So these lifts are designed to take, say, 40 tonne trucks, articulated trucks, and be able to drive into the venue. Uh, and that's been a real challenge. Um, so they take, they take the wagons from street level and into the venue, you say? Yes. Okay. Two of them. Uh, There's amazing things. Um, I'm going there next Wednesday actually to meet the meet the client. Um, but they've been a real challenge because they, when we got involved, the envelope had been drawn and, and designed, and um, it wasn't big enough. So we've had to, to had to, to adjust the design of the truck lift to fit the size of the shaft, but and still fit the size of the trucks. Yeah, so obviously that's that's a critical bit, and the architect. Uh, has not been particularly helpful. Now, no names, no back drill, but uh, they could have been more helpful. Then there's so the, the size of the lift has come down. It's still being up to a truck and it has lifted a truck already. So they used it to bring in some of the um, equipment for the main auditorium. Yep. Um, it's got some Dutch trucks that have been in already using it. So it's a big sigh of relief for me when they actually fitted the truck in it and worked. Yeah, um, I, I guess that's uh, not an, uh, an off the shelf sort of piece of kit. That's a, a bespoke design, I guess. Very much bespoke. It's the largest rigid chain technology lift in the UK, probably in Europe, actually. When we first decided to, to use rigid chain, we went out to look at a job in Latvia, uh, which is supposed to be a 40 ton truck lift. We're on using rigid chain. We got out there and it was a 30 ton. Yeah, so somebody missed, you know, um, Misunderstood somewhere. Let's that that lost, in, lost in translation, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it, was, it was a British guy, and I think he, he thought, well, 30 ton, 40 ton, you know, be, be all right. And because it, it was very strange because he had a big, big gap at the end of the platform. It was obviously designed for a 40 ton, and somewhere online, somebody had uh, reduced the spec to 30 tons. But being Europe, there was nothing to stop the truck going straight off the end. Ah, okay. So the truck could, you know, these, the, um, because they're in such a confined shaft, we've had to take the roof off the lift. So the lift has no roof. Uh, and we put uh, light guards instead of the doors on the lift. So there's the, the and the, they then combine the outside doors of the lift with the security doors. So we're to try and increase the, the, the area available for a lift. Um, so it's, it's a very unique project, and that's why I'm doing my CNG on it. And that's why I'm presenting a paper on it at the symposium. And have uh, you got CNG, or are you still uh, I'm awaiting? Still, I'm still, still working on it. Okay. <laughs> I've got so, about 4,000 4, with 7,000 words done. Okay. And timescales wise, you're planning on submitting that this year? What to do? Because my, my sponsor gives remind me, she's a, a very senior person in the lift industry. And she keeps reminding me that she, she's not getting any, young, any younger. She's retired. She's about 86, I think, now. And she, when I saw her in June, she says, get that finished. You know, and um, so I need to get it finished before my, anything happens to her. Wow. She, she was my, my sponsor for membership as well. OK. So it's, um, but it, it is a challenge doing your day job. You do a full day work, writing reports and, doing, and then to sit down. And right, the change bit is very difficult. It's um, yeah, it's a challenge, and you know, there's only a, a certain number of hours in the day, and, and fitting everything in, um, yeah, it's it, it's challenging. Um, 
And so you mentioned uh, some really interesting work on uh, energy efficiency and, um, uh, you know, the, the lighting refurbishment works that you've done to, to move from an inefficient fitting to a new fitting. Um, what sort of works are you doing in, in uh, transportation escalators uh, on uh, energy efficiency? Uh, what, what are the latest technologies? There are actually a, a battery operated mm -hmm. lift, sort of about the dog barking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Could that be so? Yes, yeah, so there are battery operated lifts, which we're, um, we're trying to find an application for. We think remote stations will be good for it because um, the lift is usually one of the largest power consumers on the station as a single source. Uh, so by using a battery operated lift with PVs and even wind turbines on top of the lift shaft, because of course it's a nicely exposed piece of kit on on top of the station um and it's and we're also looking at a fiber reinforced plastic um for the lift shaft itself to reduce the weight but it's one of those things that um it hasn't got any traction at the moment we're doing some station work we're just always tendering some station work from new stations but we haven't landed one yet and then as it happens these stations that we're looking at are in a populated area so there will probably not be an issue with power supply to the station, as if, as if it was a rural station. Um, but generally speaking, we, we encourage the lift companies to, you know, to produce, provide the most efficient lifts, you know, to bring on excellent standards with regeneration on them. Um, but at the end of the day, the lift isn't one of the major power consumers in a building. Um, that, so we always smile. They say, "Yeah, we're going to turn the, the uh, car lights off as energy saving." You're thinking it's like turning the toilet lights off and saying you're contributing something to a, a building. It's, it's such a, in a small amount, but the lift industry gets a bit carried away with itself. Um, probably the, the best one is the regenerative drive, where yeah. actually, um, and again, that all doesn't always work because you need a tall travel and a frequently used lift. Um, on some lifts, it's not worth doing it because they don't work often enough to, to give a payback. Yeah. Um, and uh, other times, we're actually doing a data centre down in London, and uh, we were concerned there that regen might affect the generators that are part of the um, data centre. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's all it's it's not always as clear. Could say yes, must have regen on it, must have automated shutdown, um, things of that nature. You mentioned um, uh, fixed chain on uh, the the the, mat, the uh, forty ton lift job. What can you explain a bit more about that in comparison to other technologies? Yes, it's uh, basically it's a chain that uh, as it comes into the vertical locks together. It's um, a, a very large, large chain. This one is um, that sort of diameter. That's a width rather. It's a square chain. So, but the, all the surfaces of the chain link are flat, as opposed to a bike chain where they're rounded. These are flat. So, as it comes around the sprocket, it actually clicks together, forms a rigid column. Um, so, it's a very simple technology. It's basically a motor, prop shafts, a couple of gearboxes, a couple of planetary gearboxes, and they just pushes the load up. Um, so. The, it's uh, very similar in many ways to a hydraulic lift where you use the energy going upwards but coming downwards it's just uh, basically running against the brake or using the brake to stop it at the end or using the, the, the variable speed drive to control it and using gravity um, and gravity is a lot simpler we did look at uh, a traditional scissor lift with a high pressure hydraulic system and we chose the, uh, the rigid chain on the basis that it's lots simpler and less move are more moving parts but it's like an old-fashioned car the almost a thousand will carry on going forever but you compare that with <laughs> the modern car where yeah. you know, everything's stressed to the maximum and it will have a very short life this just chunks around so it's, it's very much like um you know compare a low pressure technology to a high pressure it's um, because it, the lift itself has eight of these cassette units, as they call them, eight, eight chains to lift it. So your load is distributed between, across eight uh, different uh, chains, eight different gearboxes. All synchronized. Uh, 
they all synchronised. Two motors, so if your motor fails, you've still got one drive motor, four brakes on it, because uh, it is man riding. And some of the challenges involved, apart from the, the spatial constraints of it, is that um, before we got involved in the job, they, they deleted the staircase next to the lift. They got VE'd out by the architect or by the, the team. Um, so we got involved. The, the idea was that the truck would drive into a lift, the driver would get out of his cab, walk around the building to a, a staircase, walk up a staircase, six and a half metres, walk through the building, back into the lift. So the lift will, will come back up to up to the level then, climb down to the platform, walk along the platform, back into his cab. We said, that's a nonsense. You know, it's going to slow down the operation dramatically, you know, especially when you're doing a build up to a show or when they're knocking down the performance and they've got 20 trucks lined up down the street and you've got all that palaver. So we said that the guy needs to be able to stay in his cab and so part of our, our challenge was to make the lift man riding under the machinery directive and that has taken some doing because it's um the risk of a, a fire on the truck was one of the challenges is that cause it's only going for very slow points of uh, 0.75 meter per second it takes 80 seconds to travel and the fire engineer was concerned that a fire may happen and the guys on the platform will be trapped in the lift yeah. Uh, so we had to go to a great deal, le straight lengths, doing a fire cause and effect for the lift on how it happens, doing a personal, uh, a personal emergency evacuation plan of PEEP for the lift. I did that as well to show that in the various scenarios that the personnel could escape from the platform uh, to a place of safety or a place of relative safety in time. Um, so it is now man riding again. But it was it was man riding and all of a sudden this fire strategy came out mid project and said it's not man riding. Yeah. So, whoa, whoa. You know, and then we had to sort of convince everybody, building control and all those authorities that it could have people ride on it. Um, otherwise, it was it's going to be impractical operation wise. Yeah, um, you, you mentioned. Um, so I, I'm guessing that the, the fixed chain has better or greater load carrying or, or conveying. Uh, credentials to to alternative technologies. What what are the alternatives and and the more standard uh, uh, technologies to to fixed chain? Uh, uh. A scissor lift with a hydraulic um, power pack, and we went to look at one in London uh, as a part of the same exercise. We saw a hydraulic lift in London used carrying trucks, and we saw a rigid chain used carrying cars. But the thing about the one carrying trucks was it, everything was high pressure. It was less than five years old and they had to change all the hydraulic hoses on it for, for whatever reason, because everything's stressed, you know, it would be high pressure. Uh, and it had to have air coolers. And we went into a lo the, uh, the loading bay area and you, and you could hear the air glass coolers at the other side of the loading bay. It's a big loading bay because um, they were basically having to get rid of the heat from the, com from the actual uh, hydraulic system. Yeah. Um, so that that's one reason we went to the rigid chain is of energy saving to a point, but there was no, there was nowhere for the hydraulic power pack. There was nowhere to put these next to residential buildings where it's lift is in Manchester. So there's nowhere for the um, the cooler to go. So it was it was a challenge itself to get the scissor lift in there, um, and and the ancillary equipment was it was impossible. So that's why we chose the rigid chain. There is a technique of using rigid chain with a scissor lift as well. So rather than having the hydraulics, you have the scissor, the chain pushing it up. It's like the Indian rope trick. It, it's just to see it working is, as an engineer, blows your mind. Yeah. It's, it's a shame it's in Manchester. I don't, don't organise a visit there for the Sibsley Lift Group. That's oh. Sibsley, West Midlands. It could be a, a collaborative thing between the two regions. But uh, do you get involved in passenger lifts and goods lifts as well? Say again. Do you get involved in passenger lifts and goods lifts as well? Yes, they are, they are bread and butter. This was a, a one off. This is um, you know, one that uh, the project managers who were doing it were the same project managers who were on the um, the Liverpool Stadium and are also on this skateshead job. They put us forward to the more than well. Um, so it's uh, 
but it's our, it's our normal bread and butter is lifts and escalators. Say we did yeah. Man Manchester Airport, which is um, a large project, which we did from scratch. Uh, the expansion of Terminal 2, and that involved uh, 24 escalators and uh, about, 20, about 20 lifts. And what about firemen's firefighting and the evacuation lifts? Yes, we're doing a lot of work. We just did a job recently in London as a retrospective one. We do a lot of design, lots of residential work, which for the London plan is now involving firefighters and evacuation lifts. Um, and we're doing a to incorporate into our design. We just did a job for a, a client in London who has a residential building, this existing one, and the two firefighters lifts were out of service because they were, had um, a foreign made control panel on them and they couldn't get support from them. the lift company said can't fix these need new two new control panels and it's going to fit fifty thousand pounds per lift so the lift out of service the firefighters lifts in a residential block in london and the client's got a facing a bill of a hundred thousand pounds so they they got involved we've done some other work for this client previously and we got in touch with the, the overseas supplier, found they hadn't been paid by the person who installed the lifts, sorted the deal out so the client will pay them what the shortfall was, and then they will supply the spare parts. And we got the two lifts into service for about um, £10,000 total. So we, should, we saved the client £90,000, and he got his two lifts back in service uh, very quickly compared with ripping the control panels out and um, putting two new, two new control panels in. Um, so, so yes. An engineer and a peacemaker and a negotiator. That's absolutely, yes, we did. It's very strange we're dealing with, it was in Croatia, but not, uh, not a country well known for control panels. And uh, what we found the manufacturer, <laughs> um, made contact, made the relationship with them, found what the problem was. And um, it's, it's, a, it's we find, I find it's all about people. The engineering bit is quite straightforward. As obviously, my experience to help makes it straightforward. But it's a people bit, which is a challenge, working with yeah. people. And um, and that was a good result. Yeah. Uh, other than SIBSI, are you a member of any other institutions or professional bodies? Yes, I'm a member of the uh, IET. Um, actually, just got to aim just after being a member of the uh, of SIBSI. And they accepted the same paperwork. Whether you want to keep that in, I'm not sure. But uh, yes, it was. Um, it's something that not everybody's aware of. That's um, yes, they, they accepted. So I'm a, a member of IET, and a mem and um, obviously a mem member of the Sibsi Lift Group. Yeah. Uh, Executive member. And um, what advice would you give to someone wanting to pursue a career similar to yours? Uh, probably, it, I think it's helped coming from outside the industry. I, I do a lot of people and they're lift engineers and that's all they've ever known. But because I come from outside the industry, I look at a, 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 a firefighter, firefighter's lift shaft. Um, I can uh, I bring a lot of experience that from the building services point of view, uh, not just a lift point of view. So we find that we can advise clients on that. Uh, one of my uh, part-time jobs in last previous, well, I've done is a uh, retained fire service. I was a crew manager in the same fire service in Staffordshire for 10 years. Um, and I'm also on the contingent fire service for London. Um, so I've got a lot of experience from the operational side. So when we're looking at firefighters lifts and firefighters shafts, I can actually know, you know what the requirement is from the guy actually organising the, 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 the firefighting operations. Uh, and I found that very helpful. Um, yeah, it sounds uh, really interesting and, and challenging at times and uh, having having that variety and uh, yeah, bringing the experience from outside the industry and applying it and, and being able to communicate and, and interpret and, and understand and, and give advice. Um, yeah, all, all useful skills that uh, any professional, not just uh, an engineer, could could can benefit from. Um, mental health. Just just on that one before we leave it, but on advice from joining the lift industry, I would say definitely it's a, a good career move because every building that's got more than uh, one floor is going to have a lift in it. So the, the number of lifts installed in the UK is going to increase year on year on year. 
Um, and the great thing about them is they don't mature like wine. They're they are, and, and very often the, the main contractor will put a lift in and it will be the cheapest he can find. And the problem then, of course, is that it's not going to last. So coming into the lift industry, he's going to work on the new lift side, but there's also a growing amount of work on the modernisation side on the existing lifts. Um, we're doing a lot of work for the NHS warehouses. We're, um, we replaced, uh, we replaced a lift of one warehouse in um, the Yorkshire, and we modernised a goods only lift in Bridgewater in Somerset. Uh, again, client, in a, a case in point where we saved the client a, a massive amount of money. The incumbent lift, lift maintainer wanted £80,000 to replace the lift. We got involved. The client says, go and survey it, Phil. See what you think. I've worked with the guy before. Went to look at it and said, well, the, the actual mechanical part's fine. It's the control policy issue, other safety items. And we actually got the job the modernised or refurbished to, to current standards for £25,000. Yeah. Um, so that, that again, it, it's having that, that mindset of going into it and um, you know thinking outside the box rather than just thinking, well, yeah, new lift. We said, well, hang about, let's take a step back. What's wrong with this lift? And then drilling down to what needs fixing or re replacing. Yeah, and, and, and keep, keeping an eye out for the client and, and uh, budgets. Um, where do you see the industry going next? Sideways. Yeah. Yes, there's there's, there's mute, muted or some consideration on some manufacturers looking at it, lifts that go sideways as well as upwards. Because um, obviously one of the issues we have in tall buildings is cores, core size. And the problem is that, that you get lifts that go so far the building and then go uh, again, you know, onto another lift. And there's there's ideas about making lifts that can go up sideways and upwards again. So you don't have to change lifts. You, you know, it's a one. Well, we've done a job in London recently where it's an eight car lift group, a large building. It's a, a refurbishment, not a new, but a refurbishment where we put hall call destination on it. And what that means basically is you walk into the building and you either swipe in and you know which floor you're going to go to, or you tap a keypad which floor, it will then guide you to the next lift that's going to that floor. So rather than it's uh, going along like normally, you press the button, first lift comes, you get in it, and it stops everywhere. These lifts will stop at prearranged floors because it knows where you're going. Okay. So the next person that comes along might be going to the same floor, you'll get the same lift as you. person behind that might be going to a different floor, and they'll allocate a, another lift to them that's going to those floors. Uh, so it's a way of improving the efficiency of a number of lifts um, by about between 10 and 15 percent. And we did that on a building in London as a, as a, a modernisation for a main contractor, actually. We were, we were working, uh, which is unusual, we don't normally get a lot of work from main contractors. But on this one, uh, we did, and we've done, we're doing two other projects with them since then. It's one um, you know, one you've worked for. Sideways elevators and lifts sounds a bit Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory ish. It does, yeah. And um, but you think about it in many ways, um, it's only applying engineering, isn't it? You know, rather than sang, hanging a box on some ropes and going upwards, you just have a, a different means of moving the lift. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's actual fact. You know, have you been to? If any of the uh, viewers and listeners have been to Disneyland, either Paris or in Orlando. They got the Tower of Tower of Terror, and that actually has sideways moving lifts in it. Okay. Yes, there's um. I think does it? It may be something on the lift on the lift webs on the um. It's actually it does the lifts actually move sideways. Okay. It goes so up, te te rocks. technology's there. It, it's uh, just not uh, regularly or, or commonplace, I guess, in in the industry. That's right, and it, they say it, it will come that way. Um, What's the and, tallest lift lift you've worked on? 44 stops, 44, we call them stops, 44 floors in uh, Croydon. Okay. Residential? Uh, resi, yeah, yeah, private resi. Uh, and that was a challenge because we're, uh, we're doing the uh, final commissioning of it. We did the uh, tail end works on that for uh, another consultancy. We did the, uh, the final commissioning. And what part of our duties is on the commissioning and the defect inspection is to check every landing door. 
So we ended up walking down 44 floors, looking at landing doors and making sense any had not aligned up, any damage to them. And that was, he was dizzy at the end of it because round and round because he couldn't use a lift. Yeah. You go down the lift, when you step out of a lift, you have to wait for the doors to close and then press the button again in the meantime, somebody's nicked your lift. Somebody else has called it. So it's easy to walk down the landings and uh, check the alignments. Was that over so, a number of days? No, that was a single day. It was a long day. It's <laughs> probably done as well. I'd say, yeah. It was, uh, and there was one of the lifts was a firefighter. Because uh, it's interesting to know that they're not firefighting lifts now. They are firefighters. Um, the intention is to get the fire firefighters to the bridgehead floor, which is generally two floors below the affected floor. Um, because there was a lot of people called the firefighting lifts, and they're, they're not that's not their function. They do have the features on them so that if they come to the fire floor by mistake, when they press the door open button, the doors will open. If they take the finger off the button, the doors will shut through again. It's a pen it's function or something, isn't it? Peekaboo. Peekaboo is called. <laughs> yes. Um, that's a real technical term. Um, so the firefighters' lifts do have that feature on them. Well, in the, in the same way that you and, and nobody, I don't think, would want a face full of snake. No, the, these guys, I you see. know, the firefighters don't really want a face full of smoke or flames. So, yeah, uh, crack the doors open and see what Sorry. you're uh, potentially dealing with. And if it's a fire, then, yeah, get back in the lift and go somewhere else, I guess. That's right. And also the firefighters lifts now have self-rescue inside them, which as a firefighter I'm not sure about, where they actually have a ladder built into the wall of the lift shaft. Uh, and the ladder on the and the outside as well, on the outside of the lift. So the firefighter can climb on top of the roof of the lift car and then get the ladder from the side of the lift car and climb to a landing to actually self-rescue. Okay. Previously, rescue was always outside, which I think is a better way of doing it because there'd be nothing worse than a firefighter climbing on top of the lift car and somebody is being helpful and moves it for you. You know, it's uh, it's not going to be a good result when you've got a ladder, ha you're halfway up a ladder going to a landing and the lift goes the wrong way. But uh, so, yes, firefighters' lifts, not firefighting. Now, the L London plan does go to great lengths about the, the firefighters' lifts and the evacuation lifts. And uh, did realize there's not a British standard for evacuation lifts. Oh, right. There's a provisional standard, PR EN. 76, 81 76, but there's actually not an approved standard. And London Plan refers to evacuation lifts. The nearest you can get to it is a BS 9999 or in residential BS 9991. That's the nearest you can get to an evacuation lift. But there's actually not a standard for it. It's a standard for firefighters lifts, but not evacuation. And evacuation it's, is for general public rather than members of the firefighting service, I guess. Yes, and that thereby lies one of the rubs. And why it's not not come from a provisional British standard or a European standard is that nobody around Europe can agree on it. They, they all have the different views. They agree on the firefighting one, but the, uh, the evacuation ones. Uh, and one of the issues that are is, that people have is who can use it. They go ideally, the person who can use the stairs should be a priority you priority user. But the problem is is how you actually Trans transfer that requirement into technology. Yeah. Because in the event of a fire, somebody leaves their apartment or their office on the upper floor, goes to the evacuation lift, and unless they've got, you know, have a key, in which case you've got to remember to take the key with you or the swipe card with you, somebody else can use it. You know, yeah. an able body person on the upper floor says, I'm not going down all, all those stairs. And he gets in the lift. And so it's a difficult challenge how to make the lift accessible only to disabled users. Yeah, it's um, an interesting dilemma. Uh, and especially in Resi. And an office building, it's not too bad because you have it, the lift manned. And you put a lift with the Anfield Stadium. The lifts at each end of the new main stand are evacuation and firefighting. And um, they are dual function. So before the fire brigade rock up, the evacuation. When the fire brigade rock up, they become... Uh, firefighters lifts because the the role of the firefighters as an incident isn't to evacuate people that's a management function um the two lifts on, on the anfield stadium uh at each end of the stadium are firefighters and evacuation so before the fabric evacuation plan uh for the building for the fire brigade 
turn up, this evacuation, they can take out wheelchair users only, which is it's manned by a steward. There's an advantage to a, a commercial building. Uh, and then when the fire brigade come, they take over for their purposes. And we did a lot of timings on how long that will be, how many wheelchairs we evacuate. But, but on the new main stand, there are 81 wheelchair positions we need to evacuate. Um, and because there's two lifts, we, we established that the chances of fire being at both ends of the building and the fire service wanting to use both the lifts. Simultaneously. Yeah. And plus the other saving grace in the stadium is the bowl is considered a place of relative safety. So if the worst came to the worst, you could put the actual wheelchairs back into the, the seated positions in the actual lodge and the bowl itself. And they were then in a safe position. Uh, and they say we took nine iterations of the, of the report to get past building control that uh, convinced them they could get all 81 wheelchairs out. Um, so so when, say when the fire brigade rock up, the, the actual people leaving the state, leaving the building aren't their issue. Their job is to fight the fire. If it then goes wrong, it becomes a rescue and they will then take over. Um, and what we say about the, the, the residential building is because you haven't got a, a building manager or somebody to operate the lift. That's where it all gets very, very messy with uh, trying to get disabled people out first. Yeah. Um, Excellent. Well, just a, just a last couple of questions, if I may. Um, what do you like to do in your spare time? Uh, we were paddleboarding last night. So paddleboarding is uh, we've bought, bought ourselves a paddleboard and um, I we go canoeing as well. I've been canoeing a lot of years. I've just given up being a, a scout leader, which was a, I was a scout leader for 45 years. And my son's now taking it over as a scout master or scout leader. Excellent. And where can people find out more about you or connect with you? We have our, our website, uh, pearsonconsult.com. We're a .com because obviously we work internationally. Um, and obviously LinkedIn. And uh, and I need to put my email address on the uh, on my screen behind me. Excellent. No, note to self, yes. Well, pearson at pearsonconsult.com. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for joining us and sharing with us today. Um, and if anybody would like to share their thoughts or contact us, please don't hesitate to do so. Also, if anybody would like to feature in a future episode or know or can think of somebody that would like to find out more about or is an inspiration to them, please get in touch. Uh, please like, comment and share. And we look forward to the next episode of the Sibsey West Midlands Region vlog and podcast. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Joss. It's been a pleasure.